I'm joined today by uh, Phil Horton, who's the sustainability manager for the RWA, and we're talking all about electric engines. Um, and we're down by uh, down at Hamble, and we're looking at Phil's um, tender. And uh, Phil, you've just got yourself a um, an electric engine, so maybe we'll, that's a good starting point, isn't it? Yeah. So so when we got our our boat. Um about 18 months ago, it didn't have a tender with it, so we, we bought ourselves this uh, this second-hand uh, rubber dinghy, and we're looking for an engine for it. And obviously, being a sustainability manager, I wanted to use the latest sustainable product. So it's really straightforward to, to change the battery on here. So you just undo the the power connection, power and control connection, undo the lever, and it just comes off like that. And you could replace it uh, with a, a recharged battery, um, and then it just drops back in, locks in place, pop the power lead back in and you're ready to go. Turn the power on. There you go. The first thing I can say is I can't believe how quiet this is. It's just like a little... You can it's barely hear it, right. can you? It's, it's lovely, it really is. There's just there's no background noise. I mean, we're, only, we're only going very slowly here. We're just using 70 watts at the moment. It's got a, a readout on here. It tells you the power consumption, how, how long you can keep going. Um, oh, okay. It doesn't go above 10 hours, so it's saying 9 hours 59 at the moment because we, the battery's fully charged and we're going very slowly. But as you accelerate, you'll see that eventually it'll start coming down. Yeah. That's still only using 150 watts or so. Um, and we're going quite quite happily here. On uh, It's probably around high tides. So it's probably not much, not much low at the moment. Yeah. Um, and that says it will last about seven hours at that speed. Oh, wow. So, that's, that's really impressive, isn't it? Yeah. So if we're using it in a, in a sailing club environment or a training centre and we're delivering uh, maybe monitoring small dinghies and things i guess while you're um apart from the massive advantage of being able to speak over the engine yeah. which is huge it can't you know that's we're forever saying switch off the engine so people can hear you yeah uh, you know that is really brilliant and, um, and, and if you stop it, it obviously it's, it's it just stops completely you've got no tick over noise you've got nothing at all that, um, that's amazing isn't it and then it's not using any power at all either so you're not you're not wasting any energy when you're stopped so we're just effectively sitting here in standby yes. almost yes, wow right. and yet here we get we can hear a boat just coming on down the river towards us and yeah and that's only going you know really slowly but it's pretty noisy from over here so, so and that's one of the things with electric drivers it's, it's very efficient by comparison with that so that, that boat obviously is keeping the speed of us here and so it's going very slowly compared with its its whole speed or its, its yeah. usual speed so that engine is probably only about 10 percent efficient at the yeah. moment using lots of fuel for doing not very much whereas with the with the battery you, you you might be concerned about the capacity but actually you're only using the amount you need um, when you need it so we've seen just how quiet that is but um aside from your job title what made you go for it <laughs> well it, it was because we didn't have a, a tender for the boat we just had to start from scratch we, we found this second-hand rubber dinghy and just decided that we, we were going to go electric and um, there were lots of options appearing on the market at the time um, and the reason we ended up with e propulsion was simply because they were based in Hamble and it was just convenient at the time um, and it's just amazing it's it's a one kilowatt motor it's a one kilowatt hour battery and that's ideal for us going backwards and forwards to the, to the boat which is on a mid-river mooring um we've we've moored up at the entrance to the Bewley river and we've managed to uh, we've managed to go all the way up to Bewley and back again and still have a quarter of the uh, the battery left to to come back ashore again when we get back so um and, and for us it's also it's the ease of handling because we have we, we wheel the dinghy down to the front but onto the slipway we wheel the, the, the motor down we don't have to take fuel with us it's it's no that's a treat it's isn't very, it very very cheap to run um so, so yeah what, so do you know how much it costs i mean that's always what people want to know about electric things but it is fascinating so i mean the the unit itself the, these typically are around 15 1600 pounds maybe a little bit more now um mm -hmm. for, for others that are similar like torquedo do a similar one and there are yeah. other products coming onto the market there's not a lot to choose between them really um but in terms of running costs there's, there's no maintenance essentially unless you unless you damage the, the prop or something um, and to charge it up, well, it's a it's a one kilowatt hour battery, so it's probably the charging efficiency is pretty high. So you're probably using one and a half kilowatt hours. So what's that going to be at current prices? Maybe thirty pence. 
Wow, 30p for, <laughs> for seven hours worth of running. Oh, yeah, five, six hours at least, yeah. So, yeah, so the, the real key thing when, when deciding on electric is uh, working out how you actually use the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously this is ideal for us for a yacht tender. If you're using it at a club, then this would be ideal for, say, working with, with juniors in, in Optimus dinghies where you're not racing around the, the race course all the time. Um, when you stop, it, it stops using any energy, so you don't have to worry too much about, about capacity of the battery. Um, I mean, thinking about it in the context of bigger boats, uh, our boats are Vancouver 27. Um, we got a, a price from Ocean Vault to convert that. It's, it's very expensive, so I'm not doing it at the moment. But what it gave us was all the information on the, the power requirements. Mm -hmm. So if you drive that boat at, at whole speed, it would take about 12 kilowatts. If you run at, at whole speed, it's about six and a half knots. If you, if you drive it at three to four knots, then you're using one and a half to two kilowatts. So the power requirement goes up exponentially with speed. So what I would say is you have to really be more traditional in your planning. You have to use the elements. You have to work with the tide rather than against the tide. Uh, and you have to work with the wind rather than against the wind. Yeah. So it, it, it's traditional boating really. I mean, it's everything that the RNA teaches on its courses in terms of how you should do these things properly. Absolutely. Um, I see we're so, cutting through here. Is that yeah. because we're in the tide and we're heading over to a shallower bit where there might not be as much tide? Uh, absolutely. So I think we were using about you know, 500 watts there in the, in the main stream and as we come through uh, in between the, the pontoons here and into the shallows we're, we're dropping down to 200 watts uh, but going at the same speed. So I'm able to throttle back and keep going the same speed. Uh, so yes, it, it, it really does demonstrate that quite well. Yeah, that really that's really handy, isn't it? And and I guess it's about our anyone who's thinking about getting on, really thinking about how they can use it, rather than how it would be difficult to use, but more yes. about if I was to use it, what would I need to think about? Is yeah. that viable in my operating area? Is that Absolutely. what I want to be doing? Am I somewhere with high flow, or am I actually operating on a a, a small lake environment where there's, uh, the, you know, I'm not going to be battered about by the elements. In which case, you know, the, the power is going to last a lot longer yes. uh, because I'm not going to be putting it through so many paces. That's right. I mean, the, the, the other thing to think about is that these smaller units, where you've got the battery that you can remove, are very easy to use for, for small clubs. If you needed a larger battery, obviously you wouldn't be able to lift it in and out so easily. So you need to think about if the boat comes out of the water every day, that's not a problem because you could have the batteries in, in the bow somewhere and you can mm. just plug it into charge. But if you keep the boat on a on a mooring or on, on a buoy or on a pontoon, then you might have to think twice about how, how you would charge it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I do think that something like a committed boat would be ideal for, for electric for the start because you, you generally don't go very far with it. You, you go somewhere and you, you anchor up and even if it's kept on a mooring, you could have a small solar panel, you could charge it during the week and you, you use it at the weekend. That would so be great, wouldn't it? That really, I think you're right, the, the committee boat where it's not under a lot of strain, it's, yeah. it's a really important boat and it needs to be where it needs to be, but it's not trolling around the whole time. That, that's exactly it. And, and the solar panel idea yes. just all starts to build the case, doesn't it? Absolutely. And um, you know, the, my experience with committee boats is that you go out there and it won't start because it's not been used for several weeks. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> You're messing around with this horrible smelly diesel engine trying to get it to go, um, to, to go just a few hundred yards out to where the start line is. So it's, it makes it so much easier with, with, with batteries. Uh, they're, they're much more reliable. There's virtually no maintenance. Uh, I mean, in, that, in that case, you had an inboard electric motor for a committee boat. You've got one moving part. You've got a shaft with a propeller on the end of it. Yeah. Um, you don't have to handle fuels, you don't risk polluting the water with fuels and oils and so on. Um, and at the end of the season you can, you can just leave it where it is, maybe you take batteries ashore and put them on and charge for a bit, but you can just leave it, so it's not a problem. That, I mean that really is maintenance free boating, isn't it? That's what we're all aspiring to yes, surely. Yes. Um, so thinking about that, what's, um, what's the situation with batteries, because I think we've got a lot of uh, where it comes to cars and things and people are thinking about moving over to cars uh, there's a lot of range anxiety although that's starting to, um, uh, to to get easier as the next generation of cars come along with the with with the boats what's the risk with the batteries because they are so expensive and we are so used to shopping around for things yeah. what what would you be your thoughts on that well i wouldn't go online and try and find the cheapest one i could i could locate i mean the thing with these lithium ion batteries is they need to have a good management system on them for, and that's to protect the battery and to make it last a long time but also for safety reasons i mean you hear these horror stories about, about them setting on fire. One of the really key things about the, the batteries that are used on boats is they tend to be the lithium iron phosphate 
chemistry and you could you could um, puncture them and they won't they won't set on fire it's not like the, the examples you've seen with, with some cars mm. uh, i mean you mentioned the, the vehicle side of it the technology there is moving on very very quickly uh, and i think we'll see that moving into into boating as well um, the, the energy density is almost double now with some of the, the trial batteries so you, there are examples of um, saloon cars that can now do uh, a thousand miles on, on a charge with experimental technology we know how quickly that's that's coming into the market now yeah. so i think it, it for clubs and, and training centers it's about it's about thinking about planning ahead really and um, this this kind of application you can just drop it into an existing boat and use it it's not a problem but if you're looking at larger boats and higher speed boats it's about thinking about when the boat needs replacing planning ahead and um, really specify really think about what you need and do you need all of your boats to be able to to, to chase falling mackerels across the lake or, or or is it okay to have one or two that can have that kind of capability and, and have others that can go slower well, well just, just planning yeah, I mean, absolutely. When you when you look at the uh, the range of boats that we have in a training centre, you'll have the one that uh, is probably tiller driven and looks after the smaller boats and doesn't go very far from the club. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have ones that go a little bit further afield, um, and you know they might have a range of maybe something with a five horse. Maybe they've then got a ten and a fifteen. The likelihood is if they're working um, in a uh, estuary environment or on the sea they maybe have got some bigger ones 50s and 60s and I, I think we're a way off at the moment in terms of a, a viable equivalent uh, yes. in electric but it, it's coming for well, sure you can get electric outboards of that scale mm. but we have to think about this battery pack so you know, if, you, if you connected a, a, a 90 horsepower well probably 40 kilowatt motor they're not, they're not they're ready, but a 40 kilowatt electric motor to this battery it's going to last you five minutes so <laughs> it's about that, that balance between range and capacity and so on um, but i mean as i think you probably already mentioned the, the key thing here is that if you stop this then, then you're not using any power you're not you're not wasting anything um, so if you're on a, a race course and you're just going between the marks and you're waiting at the, at the jive mark for, yeah. for, for the fleet to come through then, then you're not using any power there other than just keeping on station um, so i think you do need to really work out how you, how you use the boats and whether you're using the most effectively at the moment as well. I guess understanding how you're using it and um, how many hours are running through it and things, you know, we need to maybe keep a log of that, possibly a little more tightly than we might be doing on, um, uh, on a combustion engine because, um, it, you know, the running hours, it depends. This one has got a, uh, a display and tells you how many hours you've done. Some do, some don't. So yeah. there's an element of administration around it, I guess, at the yes. moment, until all engines catch up with having those running hours, which, you know, if they're specifying that we need to do certain things and we need to uh, change particular components or we need to have a specific service at, at, at a certain interval, then we need to somehow be able to measure that mm. rather than expecting each individual uh, person to fill out a little logbook, yes. which which we can do, but but it's not it's not the best method, is it? No, but uh, most of the devices you get do have some kind of readout that will tell you what the, what the, the remaining capacity is or any time at the speed you're doing. I and mean, this one has a has a power readout and number of hours left at that speed. So like, it's 200 watts, so we can go for five hours. Um, we'll be freezing then. We would, yes. It's, it's getting a bit chilly now. The sun's on it. Um, <laughs> But uh, the other thing to remember with these, this type of battery technology is that you don't have to worry about how discharged it is, you don't have to discharge it fully, you can, you can charge it from any state of charge back up to full, it won't, it won't damage it. And that's um, great isn't it? That really does lend itself to multiple people looking after an item and just knowing that at the end of the day you put it on charge. Absolutely. That, that really is, um, is, is a great way of, of, of looking at it and of working out how to manage them. Yes. Um, and it's not, there's nothing complicated about it you no, know, no, compared no. to say having to do a fuel mix for a, you know, a two-stroke and they're kind of where we've moved on from mm. where actually a specific person had to look after something because only they knew the knack for it. This, this is really starting to get a lot more simplistic and, and a lot more manageable. Absolutely, and, and in terms of the lifetime of them as well, I mean, something like this would probably take 2,000 full recharges. So if you're, if you're doing that once every weekend or even twice every weekend, that's going to last you a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to so, do the math, but uh, yeah. you lost me. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you put it in a, in a sailing yacht where it's an auxiliary engine, it could probably outlast the, outlast the boat in theory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that, that's a yeah. great way of looking at it, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. 
And are we seeing many uh, many yachts moving over to, to using these as the auxiliaries, do you think? There, there are quite a few conversions going on there, and certainly for, for new boats, lots of um, boat producers are offering it as an option. I don't think many people are taking it up yet. I think it's still that, that concern about range, but I think that's partly to do with the way they've been marketed in the past, with a very large diesel engine that means you can go 300 miles, whereas yes. actually what most of us do is we go out to the river and we sail for the day and we float back into the river again. Mm. We all like to think we're going to sail across the Atlantic and need to motor for two weeks, but, but most people don't do that. So <laughs> again, I think it's, it's thinking about how you really use the boat, mm. what you really need to be able to do, uh, and again, managing the speed. So there's a, there's a couple in Plymouth who live aboard their Moist 35, I think, that's in 1981, it's converted to electric. And last summer they ran for four months with that kind of pure power. Wow. All, all of their onboard needs, I think it's got, they've got induction hold for the cooking and um, does their hot water once the batteries are charged up as well. They've got about a kilowatt or two, maybe two, two kilowatts of solar on it. And the whole thing is completely autonomous. But that's if you go along at three knots. Yeah. So they, but they can go all day at three knots just with the solar without, without using batteries at all. I mean, so that's, it, it is interesting, isn't it? Because yeah. it does take these early adopters to push things forward and for people to start to see it's possible. You know, if I'd have thought about, um, uh, you know, at the minute I'm thinking about what I'm gonna do about my next car. And if I'd have said to myself five years ago, you know, you'll be wondering whether 80 miles or 100 miles is gonna be enough on a charge. I'd have thought, you know, I'd have thought I was, yeah, what on earth are you thinking there, Rach? But actually, I've been monitoring it for a few, you know, for a few weeks to see actually how far do I drive until I come back home or something. And it, and it certainly is lower than I thought. I thought I needed, you know, 200 mile, 300 mile range on a car, but actually that's just not, that's just not true. Not with the charging that's available and things. So, so. I mean, the average journey in the UK on in a car is under eight miles. Yeah. So um, I mean, we have a, a Renault Zoe and that's got 160 mile range. So that'll get us down to Devon from, from South Coast, from, from, uh, from Southampton. Mm. So, um, it's, it's very, very straightforward and yes, you arrive somewhere, you plug it in and it's charged by the next morning. It's not, it's not difficult really. Uh, if you want to go further afield, then newer cars obviously have high speed charging, so you can stop for half an hour on the motorway and almost fully recharge it. But it's the same question really with, with boats. Um, I mean, we're going past all of these boats in the marinas here, yeah. and there's some concern about the infrastructure that's needed if they all go electric. But most of these boats only go out at weekends, so not every weekend either. So they can just be triple charged. They, yeah. don't, they don't need a house full charger. And then so they could just charge off the shore power yeah. that's already that's already there. Absolutely. I mean, actually, you could, if you're looking ahead to, to where we're going with, with energy in, this, in the country as a whole, all of these boats with batteries in them would be a, a great benefit to the grid. You could, you could have a little app that says, I want to next use my boat on Saturday at 11 a.m. And then you get paid for your battery to be used to support the grid um, in the meantime. And, and then it's ready for you when you come to it. Well, weekend, so. the future's looking rosy, isn't it? It is, it is. <laughs> so the, the kill cord on here is just a magnetic tag that sits on the on the tiller. And it just lifts off like that, so so that's now not operable. And we pop the magnetic tag back on and then we can run the motor. So I think there's probably some thought needs to be given to this in terms of the, in, in a training situation really, because this falls off rather readily at the moment. So if I turn around and just catch it on my knee, it just falls off and the, and the motor stops. So there's obviously a few little kind of design tweaks that are needed, but it's uh, something that, that needs looking at as well uh, for the kind of context that you're going to be using it in. So we've talked a lot there, um, Phil, about how you use yours in a, in a kind of tender situation. And we've talked a little bit about how uh, how people might be using them in general what about if you're a club or a training center that's thinking do you know what we want to we want to go green we want to switch over to electric mm -hmm. how what do you, what sort of advice would you give them at, at this stage well i think we've already talked about how important it is to work out how you use the boat and i think if you're replacing a small outboard then that's that's eminently doable now. You could you could just do that without without too much too much bother. And the charging requirements aren't great either. They're, they're just plugging into a normal 13 amp socket. It's not it's not difficult to do. I think if you're looking at something that's going faster or or for, for longer or maybe a coastal club that needs to get out through the waves and through the tide, then we're probably almost there, but not quite. So I think there's a lot more technology development in the in the pipeline, and I suspect that in the next well, probably even in the next year, we will see more and more products coming onto the market that address those kind of higher power requirements as the battery, battery technology improves. 
I mean, if you're looking at something that's, that's very large scale, very high speed, uh, long range, then ultimately I think we'll end up looking at uh, hydrogen fuel cells and so on, but that's not, not for a typical travel training centre. Mm. I think the battery technology will be the answer for the majority of use. Uh, and, and certainly everything will go electric drive, the advantage of that's a huge, it's just where the energy is stored comes from. And so, where do you think people could, could find out about this? Would you say, um, you know, whenever you go to the boat show, there are, there are lots of people there you can have a chat to at different boat shows, not necessarily just the boat show. Um, and maybe Chandlers are starting to get to, to show an interest and starting to have a little lineup of, uh, again, the smaller um, at tender engines. Mm -hmm. What, you know, would that be the sort of strategy to really get your hands on and have a look at them? I think you really need to try them out. Um, it's the kind of market at the moment where there are so many new people coming into it, new companies coming into it, that everybody will tell you that theirs is the only answer. And I think you need to make sure that you try everything out and make sure it works for you. Um, there are quite a, a few companies starting up now that, that don't just sell one type of, of, of engine. And they're trying them out in different locations and I, I think they'll, they'll start to see some centres of excellence around, around the country where you'll be able to go and try the different, different types out and, and see what, what works. I mean that'd be great wouldn't it to be able to get a look, get a feel of, of the different ones, to get a feel of how, uh, you know, how they all respond and, and what you think, how you think it would work with your, within your application. And I guess before you put any money down, you know, the acid test is to get them tested on, on your boats at your venue doing what you do with them. So, Absolutely. you know, having a go at towing something, having a go at writing things, because we don't want to end up in a situation where we are uh, underpowered in, in any direction, not able to, to get to things quick enough or not able to, uh, to write the boats that we're looking after. But certainly having a mixed fleet is becoming a, a possibility, isn't it? Absolutely. So, yes, not all your boats probably need to be able to go as fast as the, as the fastest boat on the water. Absolutely. Um, and you can probably, the other thing to look at is hiring them, of course, as well. If you're, if you're running a massive open meeting and you've got, you've got faster boats than you would normally have on your, uh, mm. your venue, then, then look at hiring a boat uh, for that and, and size what you have in, within the, the training centre or the club for, for what you normally use, what your normal requirements are. Yeah, I think that, that sounds like a really good idea, the hiring side of things, because then you don't have any of the maintenance costs. Okay. It's a slightly higher cost on the day to get hold of the kit, but, but you don't have the insurance, the uh, uh, worrying about the engine and, and all of the, uh, all the security issues and stuff as well. So I think that's a really good, uh, really good option. Mm. You know, it's been really interesting to have a chat about this, and, and I think we are starting to see some early adopters within the schemes. Um, we went over and met with the, uh, with the chief instructor and the Commodore slash bosun down at uh, Westbury at the uh, West Wilts Youth Sailing Club and um, they have they've got themselves a, uh, an electric engine which they're testing and trialling and just kind of get, getting used to and I managed to get uh, a little bit of footage with them so we'll take a look at that now. Great. Chris, good morning. Nice to see you here. Good morning. Thank you for the invite down to Westbury again. Well, you've made this decision. We've gone electric. What um, was in the process of thinking? Why have you only got one engine, Chris? Uh, really, we looked at cost um, because uh, we were not sure what was out there in the market. And I spent a lot of time looking around to see what was available. And we thought, well, if we all go electric and it all goes wrong, um, we we had then have to go back to the petrol so we've gone for one engine or one motor um, the we looked at the sizes um, depending on the weight of the boat um, and the availability and we've actually come up with this six horsepower um, we don't need it to plane on this particular site um, and the main reason we've we've gone for the electric is mainly because it's quiet uh, it's also very easy to steer uh, this particular one is because we've got an extra long blade on here which, which, which acts like a rudder um, and also um, it's the running costs are much cheaper than the petrol okay good so you've looked at this from a point of view of just if you like putting your toe in the water to see how this uh, engine works and evaluate it how Absolutely. did you do with your old petrols we kept it right okay. just in case <laughs> This didn't work. Right, good. Um, and in the process of trying to look into the marketplace, we've already said about 
businesses that you've um, talked to, what were some of the markers that you had in your mind about engaging with the right businesses in electric engine supply and battery supply? Right, the main reason was availability, availability for spares, and someone who would come and demonstrate to us how their engine would perform on our particular boat in, within our particular environment. Um, and the manufacturer that we have here now um, was very forthcoming and have been supportive of this engine. Um, so this is why we've gone for this particular model. So in terms of looking at the situation, you have purchased and have got an electric engine. So this looking at the advantages that this will bring you in terms of operation with people and perhaps looking at some of the disadvantages with the change of engine, what that might implicate you on training. Right. We've gone for this electric. I'll take the cover off so people can actually see what's in here. Um, the beauty of the electric is it's super quiet. It's very efficient compared to a petrol and it's easy to start because with the petrol we had problems with some of our volunteers not capable of starting it uh, because it's, they can be, if they're not run every day, they can be a bit of a problem. Um, so with this is basically just plug it in and away you go. We've gone for the, we're going to trial this, we've trialled this now for the last nine months and everybody who's used it has been really enthusiastic about the electric Good. compared to the petrol um, and it is meeting our green environment, um, there's less contamination. Um, and uh, it's really, it, it is the business to go, but we have got a few little problems that we've got to overcome. And the main problem we have is that we did a lot of research on how long a battery will last on the electric. With the petrol, if it runs out of petrol, you can just go and get some more petrol and put it in. With this one, if the battery runs flat and you haven't got a spare, then you are completely stuffed. We can see the cabling running up the side of this uh, boat that you're using, but could we now look at the, the power end of it and perhaps you could discuss with us what you think about the batteries sure. and charging sure. procedures. So, on this particular boat, this particular engine runs on 48 volts. There are engines which I looked at which run from 12 volt, 24 volt and 48 volt, but the majority now to get horsepower above five horsepower or six horsepower we have to go 48 volts this application is on a trial these are two 24 volt batteries put in series the problem we have here now is that when it comes to charging we have to take each battery and charge it separately because they're in series and people have to take it out of the boat um, to take it to our charging station the main problem we have here is that these are very expensive. Again, this is put against, if you take the cost of these against fuel, um, there's a lot of fuel you can buy for the price of this battery. We are looking at smaller batteries. We're trying to work out now, and whoever buys one of these, you have to work out a balance of how big a, outboard, uh, how big a battery you need for the time you need to run it through the day. Um, on this particular one, obviously for our use, it will run for probably a day and a half. But on uh, if it's being used to high speed, then you need the more use or more power, you, the bigger battery you want, and there's more weight for you to have on your boat. We're hoping eventually to, as battery technology in, gets better, this, these are lithium iron. Um, there is new technology coming onto the market. This is our biggest problem at the moment, not a problem, but it's the biggest worry we have at the moment, getting the right size battery for the right power plant. So Chris, you've given us a, an in-depth um, reply to my question about the charging and the situation here of how these batteries are being used, but when you do want to charge them, <coughs> would clubs or centres have to look at special charging points as we're seeing with cars? Yes, lithium ion batteries, the same as cars, need to be charged um, in a safe environment um, and there are very special chargers that charge them up um, and you cannot if you think oh 
I've got a flat battery, I'll go and get a set of jump leads from my car. Um, that won't happen um, because they're not compatible to your car. So, Margaret, Chris, it's lovely to come back down here. Normally when I'm here it's warmer, but on behalf of Rachel and the training department and myself, thank you very much for accommodating us this morning and enlightening us into the use of what you're doing with electric outboards and power packs here. So as ever, if there's anything we can do for you, always ask. And thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. Thank Our you. Pleasure. Our pleasure.